Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Dick Wall, and thanks for coming out. I know, uh, particularly with the crowd here, that you must be fairly busy. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome back uh, Merlin Mann uh, again. I, uh, oh, we had him out here for a uh, tech talk last summer on Inbox Zero, which was very well received. Uh, at the time, I compared Merlin with Spider-Man, uh, which is, I think, a uh, uh, analogy that still works. Uh, Spider-Man is a superhero, but deals with the uh, kind of day-to-day -day accidentals and uh, stuff like that. And if anybody wants a kind of concrete example of that, something to make you feel like maybe you're not quite such a complete disaster in life, uh, then you can check out the perfect apostrophe, I think it was, which was one of the, one of the best written essays I've, I've read in a long time and a, and a very uh, humble piece as well. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to welcome back Merlin Mann, and he's going to be talking about uh, somebody moving his brain, I think. So. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Is this on? Can you hear me all right? Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, no, you actually, I sp specifically, I think you mentioned that I cleaned my own underwear, which was in the, in the talk, which is a good way to be introduced. You come out and you're kind of humbled. Um, uh, yeah, it's really great to be back. That was back in uh, July of last year, and uh, uh, it was it was a really it was a good talk. It was very thought provoking for me because uh, talking to you guys, uh, you challenge uh, my very obvious insights. So uh, I'm grateful for that. It's good to be here. Um, I am going to talk about your brain, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, your life. Uh, but I want to start by talking about Mike Montero, which is a friend of mine. Uh, Mike is a guy uh, who lives in San Francisco, and uh, he's the uh, co-owner and the creative director at Mule Design. Uh, which you may know, uh, not just from their excellent design work, but also from making these t-shirts that you might have seen. You might have seen this one in the uh, New York Times recently, worn by none other than Oliver Sacks. Uh, and, uh, and Mike's a very creative guy. He went to art school. He likes making stuff. He is, uh, like most of us today, uh, a knowledge worker, which is a, a fancy way of saying he adds value to information. But um, Mule's a very, a very small kind of boutique-y design firm. And one of the values that Mike and his team really enjoy is that it's you know, a small, easy, go along, get along workplace. But Mike started to feel a few weeks ago like his life was sort of disappearing into a series of endless meetings, where every time he turned around, the meetings being called, the meetings being moved. Not these kind of like you know little thirty-second check-ins that you enjoy on a team that kind of keeps the ball in motion, but those kind of like last-minute things where everybody gets called in a room and there's no agenda, and then suddenly it's two hours later and your head hurts. <laughs> Those kind of meetings. I don't know if you guys get those here, but um, Mike, uh, Mike was really kind of reaching the end of his rope with this because it wasn't the kind of place that he wanted to work, and it was his own damn company, so it was, it was vexing to him. Um, if you guys follow Mike on, on the on the Flickr, his name is Dorkmaster on uh, Flickr. He's uh, he's a world class smartass, and uh, anytime you see uh, Mike becoming a smartass about something, you tend to first see it on Flickr, which is where I first saw his idea for what he was calling meeting tokens. And meeting tokens uh, is his design uh, for something that he wants to have manufactured uh, to use w within his team. And the idea is that, that he, he wants to create these little kind of poker chips that represent 15 person minutes of time inside the company. Okay? So if you, uh, the idea is, end of the beginning of every week, you get a little bag full of time to use however you want. Right? If you want to have a little kind of you know, 15 minute check in with somebody, it's going to cost you one token. You want to have a half hour meeting with two people, four tokens. If you want to have one of those old school 1998 sit around the table, call everybody in and hang out and talk, you can't do it. There's not enough tokens. He has deliberately not put enough bags, uh, tokens into your bag that you can do that by, by design. The idea is, though, that he's, he's realizing that if he introduces even the smallest bit of scarcity into this otherwise completely open resource, it gets people thinking a little bit more carefully about how they use it. Now, is this a terrible idea? Is this maybe the worst idea of all time? Would people eventually start hitting Mike over the head with his own bag of time? Almost certainly. It's a very constraining, ridiculous thing. But you know, Mike's a colorful guy. But something about this idea, um, and seeing this as yet, it's still a prototype. He hasn't actually made these yet. I should tell you something. But seeing that idea really kind of set something loose in my own head, um, because I realized a thread that was running through a lot of the stuff that was catching my attention in terms of how um, how knowledge workers are struggling. And if you follow any of the stuff that I do with 43folders.com, you'll see I talk a lot about things like procrastination and dealing with a large volume of email and things like meetings. And I saw in this one little ridiculous gesture something that had really been congealing. And that's the fact that I had become way too much of a bargain. 
getting my time and my attention had become much too easy. And it wasn't something that I could just blame on others, because I realized that a lot of the problem was how much I was making myself accessible to other people. And in this instance, what Mike was doing was saying, you know what, I don't want this to be free anymore. I don't want it to be that easy to take my time and my attention away. Because I think what you discover is, if you live in a world where your time and your attention have no value or very little value, you're going to see a lot of waste and abuse. And you see waste because if you don't internally have a really good barometric idea of what your time is worth, you're going to fritter it away on really stupid stuff. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to find yourself doing things that, that are not getting you to the places that you really want to be. But also, maybe more importantly, you guys seem very organized and together, so that's probably not your problem. But um, a lot of us uh, suffer from the abuse part of this, which is allowing so much access to ourselves that it becomes really easy to take us in a million different directions. And so it's my feeling that in order to become a good person and a useful knowledge worker, we need to get a better sense of where our time and attention go and make sure it's going toward the things that are really valuable to us. Because if you don't, you're going to end up going into a world of pain. You do not want to enter a world of pain because entering a world of pain as a knowledge worker means that all of the things that you want to get accomplished are going to be frittered away. You're going to find yourself like me, say, last night, just hypothetically, uh, watching Amadeus for the 15th time and reading uh, uh, Salieri's uh, Wikipedia entry uh, for half an hour. And, uh, and I, I use that phrase, find yourself, because I think that's the feeling of it. It's not a feeling of, oh, you know, I meant to now go and like, download a whole bunch of stuff off BitTorrent so I can listen to the Requiem three different ways. You find yourself there. You kind of like have awake with a start and go, how did I end up here? What happened? Where, what rabbit trail did I run down that brought me to this place? I think everybody's suffering from this. Everybody I talk to, I mean, of course, you guys, like I say, you guys are you know, extremely successful. You have a monorail in your parking lot, which is new. Is that new in the monorail? The fruit in my old fashioned was a little bit dry in my drink, but the shiatsu massage was really nice. Um, so you guys probably don't have this problem. But a lot of people do have this problem. And those people are knowledge workers who are not getting the time and attention trained where it needs to be. Uh, and I think that you find, when you start spending some time with this stuff, that time and attention end up being some of the most precious resources that you have as a knowledge worker. Knowledge worker is a knowledge work is a term that Peter Drucker, in this horribly pixelated picture, uh, first started using in the 1960s to talk about a kind of emerging creative class of people who weren't, you know, at that time it was unusual to not be a person who was, you know, making nuts and bolts for a living or what have you. He's talking about people who are essentially adding value to, to information. You can be part of a team, but you're doing something, whether that's drawing, uh, developing, you know working on Android, whatever, you're doing something that's taking all of this education and judgment that you've got in your mind and then applying it to something. And well, the quickest way that I found to identify a knowledge worker, I was telling Dick about this earlier, if you look for people with really girly smooth hands who get to go to lunch whenever they want, that's usually a knowledge worker. <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think that if we don't take care to keep this stuff together and realize what a precious resource it is, we wake up one day and find that our time and attention is gone. I don't know if you guys remember that feeling, though. A lot of you are a lot younger than me, but there's that feeling when you're in college, and everybody at some point is really, really poor in college. You know? And there's that sense of, like, I could do laundry, or I could eat, or get a beverage. But you're having to make these really, like, completely uh, economic decisions that, God willing, you're not having to make quite as acutely today. But do you remember that sense of, for example, like, you know, <laughs> that sense of the, the, having the laundry versus food decision and having such a sense of what like $100 meant, how $100 could change your life, and how not having that $100 meant a really substantial drop in your quality of life. You know, people say time is money, but the fact is uh, time is a lot more precious than money because you can always get more money, right? But you can't really make any more time and you can't make any more attention. Uh, I think we all get this to an extent, but if you think about the kind of work most of us are doing today, it's what I've started to call a black box career, which is just this idea that there's, there's kind of there's stuff out there in the world that's introduced into your world, stuff that's sort of unimproved data that has to have something done to it. That stuff all gets squeezed into this kind of notional black box. And inside the black box, all of your intelligence and all of your insight and all of your creativity is applied to solving a certain kind of problem. And then out the other end comes perfect results on time and on budget. And as long as everything inside the box goes exquisitely, nobody's ever going to have a problem with you. Because ultimately, nobody cares what happens inside the black box. right? All they want to do is eat the hot dog. They don't care how it got made. I think everybody experiences on this on some level right now. 
But I think what's making this super complicated today is that very few of us are working on a single job for a single person. Like, you know, you don't have to raise your hand, but think, are, are, is there anybody in this room now that has exactly one job and reports to exactly one person? Like, no, that's like something from the 30s. You know, everybody I know, you know, has these kind of dotted lines running all over the campus wherever they work and all these different people and all these different people who have differing expectations of them. And they're the one inside of that black box that has to manage all of those relationships at the same time. So if one person that you are committed to suddenly decides to escalate the importance of a project, whose job is it to go communicate that to all of the other people that you have to deal with? Well, it's you, unless you've got an information, information nanny, which, is that something Google, did they give you nannies? Is that, no. Not yet? No. Yeah. No, but they'll come in on the monorail yeah, when they do. The, uh, Put that on the list. Yeah. <laughs> I heard they got them in Switzerland. I don't know if that's true, but <laughs> nice campus. I think until you get a, a, get a sense, a really concrete sense of, of how valuable your time and attention is, uh, you can't really utilize it in the, in the most useful of ways. Uh, I've talked about this sense of hundred dollarness. If you're walking down the hallway and somebody came up to you and said, give me a hundred bucks, you know, you'd have questions. <laughs> you would you'd say, well, why, why, why precisely do I need to give you $100? And then, eh, just give me 100 bucks. And you say, no, forget it. Well, I lost a bet to you or something. Why am I going to give you 100 bucks? But at the same time, would you have that same pressing need to understand the situation as if they ask you to come have a meeting with them? Would you have that same sense of what, I, like what Monty Hall calls opportunity cost? Or the sense that when I go and do this one thing, there's now other things that I can't do as a result of that? And I feel like for myself, until I got to a place where I understood what that kind of exclusion meant, uh, I wasn't really firing on all cylinders. This is a, uh, an example that I've used time and again because I think it's, it's terrific. It's, it's, I first uh, saw Joel Spolsky, who's a developer that does the Joel on Software site, had used this a few years ago to talk about uh, software development. And he just says if you're thinking about the kind of features that you want to put into what you're building, you, know, you could think about this kind of fixed asset of how much time you have to build this stuff. As a, as a box. And I'm saying, think about a week of your life, or a day of your life, or a month of your life as a box, right? We can all agree that it has a fixed you know, number of kind of uh, cubic inches to it. You can't have a you know, 700 hour week, it, not in this Euclidean world that we live in. Ultimately, we have to be the people who are deciding what kind of blocks are going to go in the box. And it's critically important that, as much as possible, you try and make sure whatever goes in the box is going to be something that pays dividends in, in, the, in the long run for you. And to really, I think, the, the thrust of what I want to talk about today is trying to make sure that the blocks that never go into your box are really stupid. That way you never have to take them out. How do you make sure they never got there in the first place? And I think one of the things to do is to really start owning this stuff and to start understanding that even the stuff that you just tacitly accept as now being your responsibility need to be something that you're very heavily engaged with. And if not, you're gonna, that's what, to me, that's what leads to procrastination and that's what leads to feelings of being overwhelmed is if you have this entire horizon of stuff that you half care about, that's where your world starts getting stupid. And so getting a lot more careful about what you even just agree to fall into your life is critically important. So I, I, you know, I understand this is all stuff that you guys know, right? And I understand that this is stuff that you get. And you probably also get that you need to save for retirement, and you also get that you need to call your mom, and you get that you need to go change the tires on your car, Merlin, and you know all these things. But the trick in the kind of life hack way of approaching this is how do I make a synaptic leap so that all this stuff that I know I need to be doing is actually reflected in the actions in my life? And in my experience, there's a big gulf between those two things. And that ultimately to, to, to make the kinds of changes, even kind of modest changes about how you approach your work, uh, to get those dividends, you you've need, need to make slight adjustments to your approach uh, to go that, take that from being a good idea into being something that becomes just the natural way uh, you, you treat your work. When I was in high school, uh, in the late 40s, I uh, was taught something uh, called defensive driving, which I guess they're probably still teaching today. But in driver's ed, you had to have this idea of defensive driving, which is this somewhat revolutionary idea that when I drive my car, Yes, I should drive, I should conduct myself in such a way that I minimize the harm that I do to myself and others, but ultimately that I should avoid making decisions that rely too heavily on guessing what other people are going to do. Or more importantly, I must stop assuming that other people are always going to do the right thing. And that really the best thing that I can do, I know this sounds a little bit Ayn Rand, which I apologize for, but like if you're going to be out there on the road, how do you drive in such a way 
that we all kind of are taking care of our own little half acre. Before we figure out how to make everybody else drive better, what do I do to start improving my performance on the road? Now, the fact is you can never get every drunk driver off the road. That is, there's nothing I can do to stand up here today and tell you that this is going to make problems go, go away. But to me, that's even more reason to get better about this stuff. Because if there are going to be people out there, and, and you know, apparently, I'm told, there are occasionally toxic people and bad managers and things happen, and you've got to react to that in a way that's very agile. And I think having a set of skills in your mind about how you're going to cope with that stuff without relying on them to do the right thing is going to help you keep your sanity and help you keep focused on the stuff that's really valuable to you. And so I want to talk about this in two tracks. By the way, today I, I'm deliberately going to keep this pretty short because I'd really like to have lots of time for questions. Um, but I want to, for the rest of the time uh, hammering away up here, I want to talk on two tracks. Um, on a personal level or on a, uh, a person level, I want to talk about renegotiation. And then on a slightly broader level, I want to talk a little bit about team culture. And uh, team culture, I mean, the whole idea of team culture is something I have really been thinking about since I visited here in July. Because so many of the questions that people ask when I was here went straight to this idea of all this stuff is really well and good, but what happens when we start mixing people with different st styles and different preferences? What, what kind of stuff can we do to make that work better? But let's start, let's start with our own half acre. And I think uh, just with all uh, deference to David Allen, the guy who wrote Getting Things Done, Renegotiation is one of my favorite pieces of Getting, getting Things Done is a terrific book. Um, uh, it's not really a time management book. It's kind of a way to start thinking about your work a little bit differently and a little bit more in an action-oriented way. Uh, he talks about renegotiation as one of the three options that you face when you're overwhelmed with too much stuff. You can either do stuff, you can cancel it, or you can renegotiate it. And I've come to think that renegotiation is maybe the ultimate ninja skill because it's your ability to go in and say, you know what, this is kind of what I want to be doing, but if I turn this just 45 degrees, this turns into a project I really want to be working on. Because by, by doing fairly modest things to renegotiate your relationship to the projects that you're working on, it can have vast uh, positive changes in the way that you approach it. But again, and I, this is a little Randian, and I, I do apologize. But I, I really believe that with the great power and autonomy of the, having this first world career comes the responsibility of also owning the stuff that comes along with that. And that's where renegotiation becomes critical. And it's my feeling that you can tell so much about a person. Ultimately, maybe this would be a good way for you to learn a little about you. Think about who in your life could have access to you right now. Who's allowed to have your time right now? How long do they get your time? And with what kind of sort of pre-existing notice do they need to let you know that they need your time? Well, I think we would all sit here and go, oh, well, you know, my, uh, my boss, you know, sure, boss gets, she can jump in any time and, and, and grab me. Or like, you know, my dad, my dad's sick, he can call me any time and I'll jump in. I think most people feel like they've got this pretty locked down, right? You go, oh, you know, I'm really smart, I got spam assassin, and like, oh, the portcullis is down, man. I am not. But then you see things like this. And if you're a mail.app user like me, I don't know how many times. You, you can see up here that there, you see this ding. And that, uh, that means mail just came in. So better go check the mail. I don't know. Can you, can you tell from looking at that who that mail's from? I'm not really sure. I can't tell either because it's just a ding, right? If you have your mail open and it's making a ding noise at you, unless you're some kind of squirrely, you know, one of these pearl guys, you know, you get growl running and you got notifications popping up all over the place. By and large, anybody who emails, most of the people in this room get their attention the second that email comes in. So you're going to stop whatever it is that you're working on, in most cases, and jump over to email and go see what that was about. So this is a pattern in my mind. This is a pattern. This is not just about email, and this is just not just about ding. It's about re-examining based on where your attention goes throughout the week where these leaks are, that it's getting away. And so yes, this is one specific instance. I think, I think actually going in and telling your email program that you would like it to notify you about email a little bit less is probably a really healthy pattern. But I think the larger pattern to this is to start thinking seriously about who gets that access. And again, toward that team idea, you know, how much inside of a team do we want to agree that we're 100% available to each other all the time, including weekends? Like, when are the times when I'm not available? When are times that I can depend on having a firewall time when I let stuff stack up for a little while and I just focus on the thing that's really important to me? This is not to say that communicating with your colleagues is not important, but it, but it is a way of saying that the, it's a good idea for you to be the one who decides when that access is handed out to other people. 
Think about giving your business card to somebody in like the 50s. Like you would give somebody this business card, they would have your, your phone number on it, and you know, they'd call you during the business day. The information you give people on your card now, in some cases, gives them extraordinary, your strangers now have this extraordinary access to you anytime, right? And if you're super wired, you know, you're going to get an SMS message if this kind of a notification happens. And we're basically just opening ourselves up to BlackBerry. Fantastic tool. But think about the ways in which that gives the entire world access to you anytime. And then think about what you get in return out of that. Has this ever happened to you? You're, you're shooting down the hallway. Henderson runs up and has a quick question to ask you. And you say, OK, well, I'm kind of busy right now. Henderson's like, oh, no, no, it's only going to be like 30 seconds. And you're like, I can't do this right now. I'm totally busy. Let's, let's, let's go make an appointment. And so you hop over to iCal or you hop over to Google Calendar. And you go and you create a, a new uh, meeting for your 30-second <laughs> question. Now, I, is anybody here? Don't raise your hands, but just find me afterward if you work on Google Calendar. Uh, what happens when you, when you want to go create a 30-second appointment? In, uh, anybody, it makes an hour-long appointment. It does it in Google Calendar, too. If you click, it makes an hour-long appointment. So basically, your calendar is telling that you, that you can do about six things a day. Uh, that, might, that works for a lot of people. The larger pattern, start thinking about the defaults in your life. Start thinking about some of the stuff that is handed to you in a certain way. Think about this. I mean, so you guys, whatever, you guys went to like good state schools and you've had a good breakfast. So you have the sense to change that to being a 30 second long appointment or whatever. But think about what happens to a world in which every email program creates a one hour appointment for a new thing. We all start thinking that a meeting needs to be an hour long. I really think it's valuable to look at defaults. You guys probably know this. You guys are sitting there writing your own batch profiles and stuff like that. The first thing you do is open up the preferences. But I'm just saying, think about some of the defaults in your life and look at some of the ways that you can renegotiate your commitment to these kinds of things in a way that ends up supporting the sort of patterns that are valuable to you. My life changed when I started qualifying yes, which is my way of saying I stopped automatically just saying yes every time somebody asked for it. There's a time in the mid-90s when I was one of the few people outside the supercomputer center that knew how to make web pages in northern Florida. Well, a lot more people know now. But um, back then, it was a lot of prestige. You know? So uh, I was constantly, I was forever saying, yes, 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 of course I'll make your band website. Or of course I'll make your you know, whatever, uh, kittens for the Seminoles website or whatever. And uh, I really ended up regretting it, because I was always getting way, way, way overcommitted, because I wasn't saying. Maybe, or kind of, or sort of. I was always just taking whatever they gave me and putting it the way that they wanted it. I think it's really another hugely uh, useful move is to learn how to reshape projects. If you are having the black, black box career, in other words, if you're, if you're the person who lives inside that black box and is having to negotiate relationships with multiple people that really, in the aggregate, could take up 120% of your time, you're going to have to make these kinds of renegotiating decisions. It's not a question of whether you're going to. It's a question of when you start doing it and when you start getting better at it. And if you're like a lot of folks, let's be honest, a lot of folk in, folks in tech aren't, aren't here because you know they enjoy confrontation. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to do this. It's hard to get these conversations started. But I think it's really valuable to say things like, yeah, you know, that's really a fantastic idea. I don't have the cycles for that right now. Can we revisit this in six weeks? Or what could you do with 10 hours of my time over the next month if I were to work on this? Just finding ways to kind of reshape this stuff. Bottom line is I think it's important to just own your stuff. And I think, I think there's a, it's, it's easy to start feeling like a victim after a while when you're so overwhelmed by stuff that you feel like you're just kind of like treading water in quicksand. I think just really getting in front of it and saying that, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some slightly different decisions about this that make it into something that I'm really excited about instead of something that I dread. Um, this is the one I got to tell you, I'm really happy to talk to you guys about. I'm going to talk about some very general patterns that I hope afterward we can spin out into some more specific stuff. But I want to start talking about culture. Um, I am, have been for like four years now, I've been very interested in this idea of personal productivity and what it means to people. And I am satisfied that there are fairly modest changes that people can make. Stuff you could do to go back to your desk today where you'd start handling your work in a way that made you feel better and was a little more responsible. That stuff's not actually all that hard because you're the only person who has to agree that it's a good idea, right? If you decide, you know what, I'm going to shut off email, or I'm going to turn off the IRC for a little while, or, or for that matter, uh, I'm going to go and just plow through all this email that's been making me feel really crummy, and I'm going to be done with it. That stuff, that's not very nuanced, because it's just you. The challenge that I'm seeing now is trying to figure out 
how these different people with these different personalities, different schedules, different priorities, how do we start working with people in a way that's sane? And I think sometimes people do this in this kind of backwards way where they think we should start at the top and make a lot of policies and make a lot of rules and declare things like no email Fridays, you know, which for most people turns into tons of email Saturdays. You know? <laughs> But what, you know, what kind of stuff can we do to really start at the most kind of atomic level of like the people on your little team, you know? And I got to tell you, I'm sometimes surprised at to learn that people aren't having more conversations, more just slightly meta conversations about how they could be using the tools a little bit differently or about what their preferences are for communication. Um, I want to hear, you know, I'll just plant that seed for you guys to start thinking about that because I really want to hear how you handle this stuff. But... I want to talk in some very general hand wavy ways about stuff that I think can be really useful. I think above everything else, it's kind of like you know the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. I think it's, it's, it's a good idea to just get the conversation started. And sometimes that means trying to tackle a problem that would have kind of outsized results based on fairly small changes. And you know that could be stuff as simple as, you know what, we agree as a team that we're not going to put time sensitive information into team emails anymore because that's not how we want to use email. We agree, for I'm not saying this is what you need to do, I'm just giving examples. We agree from now on, if you really need something, like this afternoon or this morning, like either come to my cube or let's do it over IM, but have, have the conversation. When somebody new joins your team, right, have the conversation. Take them to one of these sexy little micro kitchens and have a little talk. What, how is it that our team does this? Because the best thing that you can give to people when they come here, and especially new folks, is to share the culture of how your team works. That's incredibly bad. not making them guess at that or whack at a pinata is going to save you tons of cycles later on. And they might have new things to share with you that would be useful as well. But start small. Like, don't start with, like, you know, why does Jody smell like enchiladas? Don't do anything, like, emotional. Start with something really simple. And then you can, once you have that conversation going, it's going to be easier to get into stuff that's a little more profound. You guys are probably way ahead of the curve on this, but I think working out internal I don't, I don't want to call them rules, and I'm even reluctant to call them standards, but every team, every really good team that I see has worked out, kind of sawed off the edges, sanded off the edges in how they like to operate, right? Like if you're on a team, like what's a typical team size? If you have on a team of like 10 people here, and like everybody is like bottom quoting like old school Unix style except one person, one person still insists on top quoting, like you're going to go have a blanket party on that guy. You're just going to go beat the crap out of him because it's screwing everything up. Simple stuff like that. I mean, one that I think is huge personally, and I will actually say I think this is a good idea, how you use subject lines. If you're not using subject lines well in your emails, I bet most of you probably are because you seem like a pretty smart bunch. But if you're not, then you're wasting a lot of time. You're wasting a lot of everybody's time. What if a team were to go to the little micro kitchen and hang out for 20 minutes and talk about just how we use subject lines? Are there things that we can do to just start using like EOM for su super short messages? Are there things that we need to have some kind of a code at the beginning? Do we want to let people know if something is not time sensitive? Maybe you're already doing this. But to find the patterns where there are things like this that could help everybody shave hours off their day I think that's going to be a good change. When I spoke here in July, one thing that people are just always mentioning to me now, like a bunch of people saw that Inbox Zero video. And I can't tell you how many people were like, <laughs> I feel bad because you guys were on you know, the internet. But uh, they were like, man, 600 emails a day, and they're just sending stuff to lists. And like, ah. They're like, so my sense is that there must be people who are still suffering a little bit with how all this stuff is going to work. You know? And I just feel like starting at this kind of squad level is a great place to start. Uh, everybody's got an opinion on the email stuff, but I think getting some of that ironed out um, can make life a lot easier. I talked with um, uh, Dick about something at lunch that I think is a really neat idea. I think it's interesting. Um, I, I personally just, this is just all anecdotal. I have no data on this, but my anecdotal impression is that people get hung up about people using tools differently, or in their own words, using tools incorrectly. Like, nothing will drive an old school email person out of their tree like somebody using email wrong. You know, doing the super long quote, or, or, or worse still, doing the like, you know, Proustian length email where all the actionable items are in the penultimate paragraph, and you've got to like fish through that. Like, have you, got, have you gotten these emails? The like, somewhere in here is a request for my time, but I'm not sure where. Like, start thinking about putting that stuff into different places. 
And I, I, I know I tend to seem kind of email centric. I know for a lot of people, SMS and IM is where, is where it is now. But I'll say to Dick at lunch, I've been thinking a lot about a, how a company like yours could use a Twitter like functionality, right? Like, what would happen if you started trying to stream institutional knowledge and questions through this kind of river of information that was all captured and then searchable? So, like, instead of like, so what happens now? Somebody has a question about something related to your team or your BU or whatever, that gets shot to this list of like hundreds and hundreds of people, right? Even if, the, even if each person has taken only three seconds to read that email, you still got to process it and deal with it. But I, I, don't know if, I don't know if any of you guys use Twitter, but Twitter can become, I guess like IRC, can kind of become this background application that just kind of runs. And I can't tell you how often in the last few weeks now I've seen people, we call it lazy Twitter, like lazy web, where people will ask something and like all these people will come back with examples or you know, answers to that question. I'm just tossing this out. I think it's interesting within your team or within your, your larger group, start talking about where information belongs rather than where it has historically lived. You know, There's always the wiki guy. Like Every team's got the wiki guy. There's the guy who thinks the answer to every question is wiki. Start a new wiki. And then everybody else is like, oh, I got to go to the wiki, and I got to edit the wiki, and I just want to know, like, how do I ask for this day off? You know, Go to the wiki. You know? And maybe that works. So wikis are working great for people. But you know, to, to paraphrase that old uh, quote about regular expressions, you know, if you try and solve a communication problem with a CMS, now you've got two problems. So be careful what kind of things you ask for. I'm really intrigued by the idea of what, I, what uh, I've been calling radio silence, which is this idea. I think it's kind of like the anti no email Friday. If it isn't clear, I think that's kind of a bad idea, like telling people what days they're allowed to use tools. Um, but I, I'm very interested in the idea of saying inside of Teams, what does it look like if we say for this certain three or four hour period on this day of the week, it's not that you can't send me email, it's just that you, can't, you should not expect me to respond to it. That I'm going to shut everything off, I'm just going to work closely with people on a project that means a lot to me. You know, you guys got the whole like notional phony baloney 20% time deal. Uh, but I'm talking about something maybe even more profound than that, which is like within our team, we're just, we're just going to let the world know like, you know, we're not out having a picnic or anything. We're, we're making this thing. I just think inside of a company, culture across the company, what would it look like if we had a morning each week when we were not scanning the horizon and we were just focusing on the stuff that was super valuable to the team? These are all just ideas I'm tossing out. Like I say, I, I look at these as patterns. They're semi-specific, but I think they're things, and I, again, I want to hear what you guys have to say about this. The toughest part of all this is figuring out how to spread it. If you do come up with really good ideas, this is a terrible photo, but I've been waiting to use this album cover for years. Um, you know, uh, I, there's all these kinds of things. You guys probably do these way. You probably like rent a cruise ship and hang out and have a vision quest to talk about your process. But I think the idea of like how you share this kind of institutional information is critically important. Like, I'm not a developer. I'm not like you know the mythical man month guy. But like, I know enough to know that culture has a lot to do with whether you float or sink. And the ability to pass that culture on to people inside of the company is the greatest gift that you can give to yourself and your team and the company. So start, what are some of the ways? These are really questions as much as anything. What are some of the ways that we can start letting people know what are the best practices that have worked for us that might work for you? And uh, I don't know. I'm not sure the answer is always a wiki. I think sometimes in the same way that the parts of South by Southwest that I enjoyed all happened in a hallway. I think that probably the kind of spreading of culture is going to happen in micro kitchens and hallways and while you're getting a massage. It's a joke. Um, the, um, <laughs> what it comes, you guys are so touchy. The renegotiation, renegotiation and culture, though, I think are the, are the two tracks uh, to be looking at right now. Uh, finding a way to kind of reshape the stuff that's coming at you. And I'm not saying you've got to sit around and be like you know, Johnny Pushback. But when stuff comes your way, figuring out just will the tiniest little turn on this project turn this into something that I can get really get behind and be very excited about? And then in terms of cult culture, really just beginning the conversation inside of our team about what we can do to make it better. And so by my estimation, I, I'm just a little bit below uh, owing each of you three tokens uh, right now. So I'm going to stop short. This is not the end of the presentation. This is just the end of me talking directly to you. You can pl applaud politely if you like. <laughs> Yeah. Finally, uh, I should mention that when Mike uh, put together, uh, he's putting together this set of, of tokens. Every bag of tokens that, that, that you get comes with one red Merlin, uh, which means at any point during the meeting, you can throw that down, and the meeting is immediately over. We're done, We're done here. Thank you very much.
Thank <laughs> you.